also find me on Twitter. I usually post a lot on Twitter. It's dying, Twitter. The bird is not, he's, I think, half alive, half dead. But again, as long as it keeps alive, I will keep pushing content there for free. Uh, my name is Alf, and if you're old enough, you might even know what that thing is. All right, so we're going to be starting with a very basic introduction about artificial neural network and talking about supervised learning because that's actually the thing that really works or used to be working very well. Everything else is, you know, open problem. I think this one might be, we can perhaps even call it solved, but maybe not. Uh, we're going to be talking about classification. So let me introduce some very dummy example. I know half of you are PhDs. Hopefully not all of you are PhDs in, in AI. So again, I try not to get too, too much bored. Tell me if it's too slow, too fast, complain, interact with me. Otherwise, I don't know how it goes, okay? okay. All right, so the objective is going to be here taking apart these three spirals. So what are these three spirals? I, well, I drew them with a, a parametric, uh, par parametric curve over there. We don't really care. But then just to make things a little bit more spicy, I just add some noise such that you can see finally some data points. So question for you, just to figure out whether you follow it or not. What is the input space over here? And what is my target space? Input space, how many dimensions does it have it? Two, okay, fantastic. Those are the coordinates, right? Horizontal and vertical coordinates. How, what is my target space? What am I trying to do here? Classification, uh, how many ways? Three ways, right? I, tell, I try to tell apart those three colors. So if I use a perception, so we are back in 1957 with Rosenblatt, a linear, you know, linear classifier, what is going to be happening? Well, linear classifier in this case is going to be doing that. And there is an issue here. What is the issue? Well, there are some crossovers. So what can you do? Question. So some of you will say, oh, we can just try to uh, more move those boundaries. No, I don't like it. So what we're going to be doing is going to be moving the data. That's what I like it the more. I'm like, I do things the other way around. So this is what I made when I was teaching back um, forever ago, 10 years ago. And this is like just undoing the uh, parametric function. And then I show you now a proper video. Uh, that's just cheating. And on the right hand side is going to be what usually you see online when we're basically showing you how these deci decision boundaries get morphed when you actually learn the parameters of this model. But again, this is a bit too, just to show you some uh, nice animations, but let me show you a proper animation. So this is actually I made uh, for my course. And let me show you what's going on here. Uh, sure, allow. Okay. So what's going to be here, I slightly changed the problem at hand. So here we are still uh, working with two dimension in the input space, but my target space is going to be five dimension. Like I, just take, I just try to take apart those five colors. So in this case, I'm going to be using a very uh, straightforward architecture. Uh, my neural network has two input un units. Why two? Because, of course, two, di two dimensional points. From two, I'm going to be going to a one di 100 dimensional hidden representation. So I use a matrix of size. I don't hear you, shout. No one is talking. 100 by 2, OK? I do classical uh, matrix vector multiplication. I get in this 100 dimensional space, I apply a positive part, also known as ReLU. Then I go down to a two dimensional uh, embedding space. I go up to a five-dimensional space, and then I apply something that is called properly soft argmax, that unfortunately, the majority of you will call softmax. And you forget the arg but it's called soft argmax. And there is one chapter in my book why it, that thing is true. But anyway, it's okay. You, you cannot be perfect. All right, so I, I just send this stuff through. I train the model, and I'm going to be showing you now a linear interpolation between my two input neurons and my two embedding neurons. I will ask you why it's legitimate to actually perform a linear interpolation of those two things. Anyway, I train this stuff. And I just show you, show you again now the interpolation between, again, going through the network with these data points. Uh, what you see basically here is going to be a projection from 2D to 100D with uh, remo remotion of every possible negative number, and then back projection to a two-dimensional two -dimensional space. From the two-dimensional space, I go five, up to five dimensions, and I apply the soft argmax. Uh, why do I go down to two dimensions before going up to five? Question, talk, no one talks. Like, you had to shout, but yes, that's correct. So you had to actually be able to, to display things on a screen. A screen is two dimensional, so I need two units, right? Um, and so this is basically is an implicit PCA. Why is, 
Why is a almost PCA? What is the only thing that is going to be different if I do a PCA with a neural network versus a PCA with the actual metric decomposition? I didn't hear. No, there are no nonlinear. There are no nonlinearity here. I go from 100 after the 100 with the ReLU to two to five, right? I do this. It's going to be implicit PCA. And what's the difference between this implicit PCA to actually a proper PCA? What happens? What's the missing part? If you do a Let's say singular value decomposition, what is one thing that the, that algorithm does that doing it by optimization is not going to be uh, equivalent? Yeah, but you get almost there. But the one thing is going to be the order of the, like you don't have necessarily a ordering of the singular, uh, singular value, right? So you, you don't necessarily obtain two orthogonal components. Anyway, so this is the final, um, final 2D space. And then I show you with different colors here what is the actual argmax of my final layer. So I have those five units at the output, and then I change every possible uh, input parameter, and I just show you with a specific color which one is the winning one, okay? So if I change one item, given that I change all of them, what do you do? If you have one uh, linear output given to the input, what, what, is, what equ equation is this? Do you see? It's a linear equation. What is a linear equation in, uh, if you have 2D input and one, one output? What do you get? Plane. You get a plane, yes. So this is basically the intersection of five different planes. And those decision boundaries, why are they linear there? It's going to be just the, the intersection of planes, right? OK, very good. And then finally, I also show you here the uh, final uh, five weights of my last matrix, which is E defined by 2, okay? So these are my five two-dimensional vectors at the output, okay? Nice pictures, nice things. What is the major difference between this picture and the first picture I show you at the beginning of the animation? That's correct. Now these classes are linearly separable. Therefore, I can use a linear classifier to chop off these different things, okay? So in the next uh, few slides, we're actually going to see how to do this mathematically. Are there any questions so far? No. So let me show you another network, which is a little bit uh, different. It's going to be a deep network. So instead of using a shallow network of 100 units, I'm going to show you something that is way deeper. This is going to be my network uh, at the moment. I'm going to have one, two, three, four hidden uh, layers of size two. Then I have my final embedding layer, and then I project up to three. And again, each la linear layer is going to be like an affine transformation of the previous layer, and then the positive part, like also called uh, ReLU. How does this compare to the previous animation? Question. See, I, I'm very annoying. I ask questions. How, how does this compare? What's the major difference between this animation and the previous animation? There are very, uh, there, are, there are edges here, right? Uh, what type of transformation each of these uh, chunks undergoes? It's like going in kind of a global transformation, do you see? Like the whole chunk on the left hand side moves all together, right? It's like an rigid transformation. Can you tell me what type of transformation we're actually observing? If all the things are moving together, it's gonna be, it's not just translation, it looks like also it, rotator, right? So here we are just observing a, again, a 2D, sorry, a, a fine transformation. But then basically what you actually see here, we are actually applying a piecewise uh, affine transformation to my all space. And okay, I, let me play, keep playing this thing. The point is that we were actually doing the exactly same thing in the previous animation, but before the number of edges were so many that it looks almost continuous to you. And that's actually given to us by the fact that I was choosing a hundred dimensional hidden representation. Here, since I choose a two dimensional hidden representation, you're gonna get this kind of uh, artifacts. Guess what uh, are going to be the gradients? Where are the gradients ni nicer, in the previous video or in this video? Which of the two videos made me spit blood? Nicer or worse? Which one? Uh, nicer, right? So the previous video was very easy. I just pressed enter, boom, train. This one took me quite a bit of effort to actually get it to run. Because again, this stuff doesn't really uh, work. It's very, uh, very brittle. 
And so overparameterization is actually a really key ingredient. And actually here you can see the final uh, output, which is kind of actually linearly separable, but why can I see the, those yellow dots over there? What happened with that specific like, singular value of that specific uh, transformation? How can you describe the singular value of that matrix compared to what we observed before, maybe? Or maybe compared to the other uh, branches here, other, other chunks? Do, do, does the question make any sense? You can say no, or yes, or we have no idea what's going on. You have to shout. Yes, the answer is correct, but you have to shout. I cannot hear you. Large, right? So you have very large weights there. And so it turns out these, these, metrics, these metrics will try to get things done. The gradient and will get things done by just pushing those weights uh, kind of to grow a lot. So this is actually my first affine transformation. And then here's gonna be my first positive part, right? So you can see how I, eat, I ate all those negative sides. Now I have the second affine transformation. This is computing the second uh, hidden layer. And then again, I'm gonna be eating away those negative parts with the positive part, uh, the, the ReLU. Third affine transformation, you can see how much this stuff scales things, right? And they scale it a lot, and then there's all this eating away. And the actual one thing is you can be, you're gonna be noticing in this last animation, if you pay attention. Okay, so you can see the, axis, the, the x axis, the red one, and the green axis is gonna be the, the vertical one. What can you notice? What, uh, what, um, what non-linearity non I'm actually using? I kind of lie to you. Do you catch this? Your PhDs, right? Half of your PhDs, you should be catching these things. Is it it's, not, it's not almost a relu, like, oh, it's almost a relu. Why, why is that? How come? It's a leaky relu, right? So it's a, a relu that is leaking something. Like, leak something. Well, yeah, why is that? Because it, without a leaky relu, I would have had very zero gradient. If you have zero gradient, guess what? What happens if you reach, okay, when do you reach zero? Okay, what does the magnitude of the gradient usually tell you? The magnitude of the gradient, right? So you start your training, you have some sort of gradients that. Okay, and then you, they kind of shrink when you reach your kind of minimum, right? So if you have a minimum, the gradient is gonna be Zero, right, because uh, you're at the minimum. Very good, very good, okay. Sweet, so if you have zero gradient, you don't move anymore, right? Gradient is what pushes you, well, what actually pull, you go the other way, right, of the gradient. Anyway, so th that's a major problem I had with this thing. If you use ReLU, low dimension, zero, nothing moves, right? So I had to leak it uh, in the final transformation, okay? And so eventually we have those huge things. Finally, I show you uh, decomposition, but now it's gonna be too much, maybe. This is rotation. Uh, scaling, rotation, reflection, and then translation. So uh, here actually I decompose the um, affine transformation into the all SVD things, right? Some of you will prefer math, SVD, other people prefer physics, I don't know, like you can have rotation and whatever uh, things. Anyway, so this is what, how the network does these things, right? Why did I choose two units? Because I wanted to show you that possibly you can actually do this and I can sh display everything on the screen, but that was actually painful to train, okay? Instead, the high, high, highly parametrized network was just a piece of cake. Okay, so that was the second animation. Let's get back to the slides such that we figure out how to get this stuff up and running. Uh, some convention with naming, so now it's gonna be a bit arbitrary and that, that's how it works here. So we have a piece of like a pill there that is representing my overall data. I have something on the left hand side, I have something in the center, something on the right hand side. I have some of them uh, are gonna be observed, which is gonna be the left-hand side, and some of them are gonna be not observed on the right-hand side. On the left-hand side, I'm gonna have uh, the X, which is gonna be what is given to me. I will never try to learn X. X is what is given, and that's it. The blue, blue ball Y is gonna be my target. Target is gonna be what I would like to learn. So if I have supervised learning, I'm gonna get a X, I try to learn the Y. If I have unsupervised learning, I only have the Y, very good, because the Y is what I want to learn. And then on the right hand side I have the Z. The Z is gonna be always hidden, so let's forget about it, right? It's not there. Uh, if you want more of this, I have a, another lesson about the, the Z part. For now, we can actually forget about that. 
and both X and Z are uh, optional. The only thing that is not optional is going to be the Y. This is my learning thing. All right, so a bit of names. Uh, I have my inputs are going to be X, always observed during training and testing. Y is always, only observed during training if I do supervised learning. Uh, Z is going to be never observed, so we can actually completely forget about it. And then I have some outputs. H is going to be my hidden representation. Y tilde is going to be an approximation for my Y, my target. Y the tilde, the tilde means more or less, right, like circa. And then finally, we can actually uh, figure out how we organize the data. So I'm going to have here my metrics. I have multiple samples, uh, in this case, capital P samples. And these are my two-dimensional points for the, in the plane. Uh, I have capital P of them. Then on the, uh, they have N components. So in our case, we just have two columns. On the right-hand side, instead, I'm going to have these targets, these Y, ball Ys, uh, blue ball Ys. And those are, for example, uh, one of the column of the identity matrix of size K, where K, capital K is going to be the number of classes. So in this case, if I have three classes, it's going to be either the vector 100 or the 010 or the 001. These are also called one hot encoding. And then I can just stack this in this uh, nice matrix, which again has capital P rows, one per sample, and then capital K uh, columns. We can also think about this as being like, what is the probability that each of the sample belongs to one of the classes? And so since it's going to be deterministic, it's going to be uh, one color or the other or the other. It's going to be the one is like an indicator function. OK, so let's see how these neural networks uh, are coming together. So we're going to have my pink ball X at the bottom. I'm going to be feeding this inside a predictor. What is this predictor? Predictor gives me the hidden representation of my target. So given that I have this internal hidden representation, uh, then I have to send it inside a decoder to basically decode back into the target space, which is going to be my Y tilde, this kind of approximation for my target. And so these are the equations that are exactly the things you saw before in the animation. Uh, my H is going to be this uh, F, a arbitrary nonlinearity, positive part, hyperbolic tangent, whatever, of a affine transformation of the input. Y tilde is going to be, again, a whatever nonlinearity applied to, me, to the affine transformation of my hidden representation. Let's expand this one, as, since there are some undergraduates and high schoolers. So what, is those, what are those equations basically saying? I have my input layer. I have a bunch of hidden representations, which are going to be, in this case, uh, three uh, hidden layers. So um, I just condense everything in one uh, thing on the left-hand side. And then I have the final uh, thing. And so how do I compute the first value there? So my first value is going to be given by this multiplication, which is going to be basically the sum of all the, um, the, sum of all the, the, the multiplication between the inputs and the specific weights. So each input has a specific weight associated to it, which is weighting in a, in a summation. So we have a weighted sum of the inputs, and the weights are going to be what is constituting my neural network, a bunch of weights. And so we can get all these weights, and then we have another set of weights to compute the second uh, hidden representation. And then you see now my super skills in PowerPoint. I draw so many arrows, but then Peter taught me I should use uh, ticks, tick Z. And that's a different kind of pain, but I don't know which one is worse. But anyway, so I'm going to be basically collecting all these arrows inside my first matrix there. All right, so basically that equation up there it just talks about the jth row of my first matrix. How about the second uh, hidden layer? Uh, you try to copy and paste those arrows, but it doesn't work because you have an even number of neurons and you started with the odd one. So again, drawing more arrows. Okay, so you collect them all inside the next uh, weight matrix and so on, right? So you can see there is quite many weights. Uh, the, what Jan did back then in the, in, the, in the 90s, basically, he was trying, again, to run this stuff on this Atari, no Atari, sorry, uh, Commodore Amiga machine. Guess what? There is no compute. So what does he have to do? Throw away majority of the computations. How? Using convolution. So that's the only way uh, he managed to, uh, to get this stuff to actually tra train something, right? All right, so again, more, more weights, and then we have the final layer over there. Okay, so finally, we kind of have understood how we compute those things. All right, so let's figure out how we perform inference. So back again, we have the pink ball X, goes inside the predictor, gives me the hidden representation, which can get decoded into my Y tilde, my approximation for my target. 
So X is one of the inputs of my system. This is again a machine that is trying to learn, so I have to provide the entire set of inputs. The other input to my machine is gonna be the target, the Y. So yes, I repeat myself, Y is the input to my machine. Y is not the output. If you're an electrical engineer, this is gonna hurt, I know. Uh, it does, but you had to come up with this new uh, thing, right? So Y is again an input, and how do I know it's an input? Because there is an arrow coming inside, and now I'm gonna be comparing my target to my Y tilde. And so that C over there represents the cost. A cost is gonna be a scalar that is measuring the um, distance, in quotation, it could be a divergence, right? A bit less, uh, less strict. But again, it tells me how far my uh, Y tilde is, is actually from my target, the Y, right? So I have an X, I'm getting an H, I'm gonna be shooting towards the target, and then the C measure how far off I am from the target, okay? Okay. Again, the same equation you saw before, this predictor is simply a high level, like a nice name to actually uh, refer to the first uh, affine transformation and nonlinearity. And then decoder, is, again, is gonna be a, a different English word that is used for representing the second operation. Why do we use this predictor and decoder words? So here it's gonna be uh, slightly, maybe, uh, how do I say? Uh, what's the word in English? Okay, I will just explain what I want to say, maybe we find the word. I, we try to explain, or we try to tell you how we, we think about these things, such that you get used to think the same way, maybe, and then you can actually reason with these um, items, these pictures, these uh, objects, and without using the math. Some of you love math, some of you don't. It's okay, right? And some of you reason in math, some of you don't. Some of you reason in, in, in pictures. That's one of, that, that's me. And so I reason with pictures and with perhaps specific words. So like a bit higher level, uh, a higher abstraction. Also, I use the left hand side to teach uh, kids in primary school or also grown ups, like 60, 70 years old. And so the left, left hand side is totally fine. They don't need to know another language, right? Math is yet another language to express formal, uh, uh, formal, formal speech, right? You don't need to use the right hand side. That's why I'm writing the book. The book is gonna be about graphical language expressing neural networks. Uh, I try, it's a bit ambitious, but I can, maybe, maybe it's gonna be good. All right, so again, those F and Gs are gonna be some arbitrary nonlinearities, and that specific soft argmax, maybe I'll tell you maybe not why, why it's called like that. But the point here is that we go basically from my input uh, x to this y tilde, and again, y tilde is gonna be there for a function of x. So we can actually think as going from this rn to rk. But if you just think about that, it's gonna be kind of floated. You really want to actually think that instead of going from rn to rk, we go from rn to this intermediate, very wide, large, uh, hidden repre representational space that is actually uh, instrumental to actually get everything to work. Let's have a, an example. You have some dots here of one class and you have another uh, class in the center. Are these linearly separable? Yes, no, half of you are asleep. I, I repeat the question. I have some points here and I have other points in the center. Are these linearly separable? No, okay, good. So how about I take this one, I, I flip it this way and I take the things in the center and I pop it out and I have the other circle here. Is it, this stuff linearly separable? Duff, right? And so if you allow yourself to actually go in a higher dimensional space, things can kind of can, can, can get kind of very uh, easily separated. And so it's really important, again, for this neural net to be going in this high dimensional space because guess what? Getting the scent is very happy when there are many parameters because you can simply go around things. Let's say people were afraid of local minima and so you go down and then you have like a little bit of a higher up uh, hill and then you would like to go to the global minima. And you're like, oh, I'm scared of getting stuck there. How do you go around that? Well, if you're uh, in a high dimensional space, that little mountain here is actually, it's like a, like a thing comes, up, comes like that, and I, you can just go around, right? So you can think about this way. So it's, if you bump up the dimensions, you can always find a way to go downhill. Okay? That's kind of important. Again, very, yeah. Yes, because the encoder is gonna be, if you want me the, the next lesson, the, the advanced lesson, the encoder will encode my target and then I will decode the target, uh, hidden representation. So the green H there, if it actually comes from the Y, would be my encoded hidden representation. H is not the encoded 
hidden representation of the X. From the X, which is over here, I tried to learn the hidden representation not of the H, but of the target, Y. So if I move from the X space to the Y space, I need to predict what is the hidden of the target. So I go from the input space X to the Y side of the, of the thing in the higher high dimensional, in the higher internal representation. So I, to go from right to left, or left to right, depending on where you look, look at this stuff, you need a predictor. Then you come down with a decoder. Encoder would be here. You go up and down. Predictor allows you to go from the X's to the Y's. Good, good point. Yeah, what's up? The plus is the positive part. If you look on Wikipedia, positive part function. Usually in uh, deep learning, people call it rectifying linear unit, a rectifier comes from electronics, which is basically a diode, which is a semiconductor, which basically allows you charges to go on in one direction. RELU, it's in short. But I like math more than I like RELUs, so there you go. OK, the point down there, uh, which is actually a major point, you also saw that from the video, was that high dimensional space, everything is smooth, everything works. Low dimensional space, everything is kind of bad. Guess what, back in the days, no compute, no ability to go in high dimensional space, nothing used to work, right? Now, more parameters, better, you know, okay, you, you know the, the, the thing. All right, so more, more weird exoterical things. We're gonna have one more box. And so you already figure out what is the small box? What is the type? So X and Y are gonna be usually vectors or tensors, whatever. And the red box, since it's gonna be a distance, is going to be a scalar, right? Very good. So we figure that red boxes are scalars. Now I have a big box. Guess what it's going to be? It's a, it's a red, it's a box. It's going to be a scalar, very good, okay? You're, you're, you're very uh, acute. All right, so what is this F? F is going to be actually called the energy of the system. What is this energy? Very good question. So let's figure together. The energy is going to be representing the level of incompatibility of my input. So if X and Y are compatible, then it's gonna be low energy. If X and Y are incompatible, the model will be uh, very annoyed, it's gonna be having high energy. So how do we compute that energy? The energy is gonna be the sum of the red boxes inside. Ah, boring, okay. So in this case, for classification, everything is kind of easy peasy, so no, no major uh, distinctions. But this allows me, later on, if we go to the advanced lessons, to actually uh, unlock the much, many more possibilities, okay? We can do many things. We can have multiple boxes. Maybe I have one more slide at the end. All right, so the C, what is the C? C is the cost, and the cost tells me basically this distance of how bad I shoot. So how, do it, how does it work? At the beginning, I will have my parameters that are completely arbitrary, randomly initialized. I get an X, I shoot, I shoot, the target is there. Oops, okay, I try to shoot, shoot better. I try to shoot better without shooting off the microphone, and then eventually when I finish training the system, I will be able to shoot towards the target. Once I have this train network, I can provide a new X and Y pair. If the cost associated to my Y tilde is slow, then I can say that X and Y are compatible. Now let's say I switch my Y to one other class, is gonna be likely a high cost, and so those X and Y are gonna be incompatible. This allows us to do later on very fancy things, but again, we have the energy, which is telling me the level of incompatibility of my input. The cost tells me basically how bad I am at shooting. Um, someone also has to, to tell me how much time I have overall such that I can uh, pace the, the, the thing, all right? Uh, in a, one more hour, okay. So we're gonna have also a practical session with PyTorch, I'll tell you more about PyTorch and how it comes and where it is in a bit. All right, so classification, this soft argmax, again, this weird word. Again, it's gonna be simply the um, ratio of the exponentiated uh, vector. I have there this, this S, my S is gonna be simply the last linear sum of my model. So every, every time I have a neural network, my last layer is the output of the last linear transformation. That's I, that's what I usually call my output. And then out of that, I can do different things, like sending it through this soft argmax. What is beta? Beta is the coldness, allows me to freeze uh, and convert this output to a one hot representation. All right, so we're gonna be introducing this first item on the left hand side. This calligraphic L is gonna be a function of my weights and this curly S. What is this curly S? The curly S is gonna be my set. 
For example, I have my data set, my training set. And so this calligraphic L is gonna be my loss, and the loss express the badness of my weights over a specific data set, okay? So the badness of the weights, this is the definition for a specific set of data. So do you know how we do machine learning? We try to train a model to reduce the badness of my weights on a training set, hoping it does well on the test set. But we don't touch the test set. Okay, but we train on the training set. Unless, yeah, okay, interesting. All right, so we hope this stuff actually generalizes. Anyway, so what is this uh, capital L? So capital L, okay, also the calligraphic L, all, all of them are red. Have you seen red before? Yes, what is red? Oh, very good, see, you, you are not colorblind, very good. Okay, so let's figure out what is this capital L. So capital L is very similar to the font I use for the capital C, so maybe they are correlated, but the calligraphic stuff is a bit weird. So this cap weird calligraphic L is gonna be the average of my capital L. The capital L is gonna be the defined over there, which is going to be my badness of the weight for a specific data sample. That's my per sample loss. In this case, because I want to, I will use this symbol, which is the equality with the arrow on top, which is I choose, you know, equality in mathematics is like, one symbol, it means everything, but okay. In this specific case, I choose my loss to be exactly the energy or the incompatibility of my inputs. This is one choice. We can do many choices. So first of all, we said before the F was given to us by, what's the definition of F? Very good, so the F, the, the big box, is the sum of all the red boxes I have. That's by definition. And then here we choose the loss to be the energy. So this is gonna be called the energy loss in this specific case. We can use many other losses. Um, depending on how much time we have left, we can see one example of actually contrastive loss within this first uh, small example here. This is not contrastive, this is just the most uh, standard, like the most trivial type of energy uh, loss we have. Okay, so what is gonna be that F equal in our specific case? The, from the previous slide, I know you don't have the slides, but the cost, right? So we said that by definition we have only one box, so F equals C. Very good, so finally, this is like a matryoshka, no? Da, da, da. Let's figure out what the C is. The C finally is that thing on top, the negative log, where log is the natural logarithm because we are mathematicians, of the inner product of my target and my Y tilde, the prediction. That thing has many names, cross entropy, negative log probability, whatever you want, we don't care. Okay, so let's figure out with whether we know high school math, and trust me, it's not, in my job interview, they actually asked me trigonometry. I was like, what? Okay, but anyway, let, let, let's pretend that never happened. All right, so we have X and Y. For example, I have AX, arbitrary location, then my Y is gonna be this first one, zero, zero. Uh, let's assume my Y tilde, my prediction, prediction function of my input is going to be roughly one, roughly zero, roughly zero. What does it mean roughly one? Y is roughly one. Rough, no, sorry. Soft, yeah, the soft arg max, that you, you forgot the arg, sorry. I, I, uh, what happened with the soft arg max? Why, why is roughly? Why can't it be one? It's open, right? The, it's open set, it's written up there. So the parentheses, some other people use the flipped uh, square, square brackets, right? You can write square brackets like that with the, you understand what I'm talking, right? No, yes, okay, good. So you have the closed square brackets, that is a closed interval, or you can flip the square bracket for the open, or you can use parentheses, depending on which country you're from. I'm from Italy, uh, you figure it. Okay, so moving on. So I have roughly, zero, roughly one, roughly zero, roughly zero, roughly zero. So question for you, what is going to be the outcome of putting those two things inside my C, cost? Roughly zero. Now let's be more pedantic. Which roughly zero would you like? Zero plus, zero minus? Shout. They are saying zero minus and there is one person zero plus there. Now you should agree. See, high school math, Peter. You told me they were PhDs, right? What's going on? 
Therefore, can we figure out this, please? Well, depends, right? You have uh, imaginary numbers too, right? But anyway, so this is going to be... Sure, sure. Uh, high school, you're right. You're in a high school. I forgot. So yes, there is no negative... Uh, okay. That's zero plus. Very good. So all good. So if you get like the loss for a kind of okay prediction, no problem. Guess what? Now my network is 100% is something else. Is this actually a reasonable... Uh, expectation for my network. Can my network be 100% wrong? Yes, no. Have you worked before in the real world? <laughs> why is the, actual, the, the second one, why is it actually true? Why can it be true? In a real case, not, not school, right? I mean, all of you are students, right? Like, who, who has worked actually with data? What happened with data? What's, what's the first thing you notice when you go work? Like when you leave school, <laughs> yeah, most <laughs> exactly right. It's a lot of garbage, right? So one of the major things you're gonna be doing as interns is gonna be data cleaning. Wow, <laughs> that's amazing. Okay. Anyway, so this actually happens, right? And what what happens if you train with bad samples? Do you kill the model or no? Depends, right? This neural network sometimes behave in a very uh, interesting way. Anyway, we don't know. Anyway, what, what is the output of this last thing? I don't hear you. You have to shout. Okay, for, for infinity means two things, right? Plus infinity. There you go. That's one other different thing. Plus infinity is one symbol, right? Okay. There is no such thing as plus minus infinity. That's the symbol without the plus. Okay, very good. So now we have this cost, which is screaming if you are completely wrong. It's going to be quiet if you are kind of okay. This cost is going to be giving me the energy of the system. Basically, you give me a good pair of input, zero. You give me a bad pair of input to start screaming. So then my loss is going to be that, and the loss is going to be something that is function of my weight. And so now we're going to be going the next slide and figure out that how do we train that? So by my weights are going to be basically the collection of all these matrices and biases and whatnot. And then I'm going to be having my uh, loss, which is the average of those capital L's. And then we can have a small 2D version there where basically I have only one weight down there, completely unrealistic, but I can start at spe a specific uh, initial location, W0. I have a specific height over there, which actually we don't even care. Uh, we check what is the gradient. The gradient is, or the derivative, is positive or negative? Petar, what's going on? <laughs> Do we have to vote? What's going on? <laughs> is it positive or negative? The derivative? Oh, okay, thank you. Okay. So if it's positive, I have to? Yes. Step backward, right? So we go backward and go the left direction. So we would like to step in the negative direction of the, of the derivative, such that we go downhill. Let's call gradient descent. Just go down. How do we compute these um, derivatives and gradients and whatnot? So we use something called chain rule. Mm. So I don't know. It's like a lot of symbols, but I have no idea what that means. Don't worry. I have slides. So that's actually called backpropagation. Oh, that's why we use PyTorch. So PyTorch was made by my student in 2016. He was my undergraduate student. And he's like, oh, I don't like this torch you're using with Lua. It sucks. Let me just write it quickly in, a, in a Python. Three months later, we have PyTorch. I never seen an undergraduate like that before. It's insane. I gave him my Vim configuration. He still used that. He, he moves the, the screen. I'm like, what's going on? Like, why are you scrolling? No, I'm coding. Like, wait. <laughs> okay, fine. See, I'm used to feel dumb, but that's just, you know, a reminder. I, anyway, like, sure. Okay. Could you share the Vim configuration? The Vim is on, on, uh, on, on GitHub. I can show you event, the, the, where my GitHub is because I have all the notebooks online, right? Again, if you check his uh, Vim, he has my configuration. But again, it's like when you meet a professional pianist. You don't see the fingers. It's like, what's going on? I'm trying to play. Dun, 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 dun. Okay. Anyway, 
Uh, moving forward, right? Yes, why not? Free energy, just quickly uh, to understand what's going on. So these were my, my initial spirals, and that was my final, the other way around. So here I show you what, what's the major difference between this picture and the previous picture. The previous picture, the one that was the last uh, version of my animation, I show you what happens when I have my spiral going through the network, and it gets disparalyzed by the model that was trained with the task of unsparalyzing the spiral. So you have unsparalyzed spirals, and then you can do linear decisions to split the things. In this case, instead of looking at the data from the top of the network, okay, you know networks go from bottom to top, right, as I've been drawing everything. Why, why is it true? Because you have low input, low level, low representation, then you go in the higher dimensional space, so the things go up. Anyway, so this thing here looks at the straight decision boundaries from the input. So your site gets warped, or well, the decision boundaries get warped such that they match the data. The last frame of my animation was just looking at my data that is warped in the input space, and it gets unwarped by the model. So when you look at it from the top, you're gonna see the uh, linear separable data, okay? All right, so let me show you how, how this energy uh, w looks after we train the, the model. So here you can see, I chose in the first case, the, if you look at the title, I have my energy for the X and Y, where my X is gonna be all the possible plane, and then my Y is gonna be in this specific case, the first class, the red class. And so all the area on the bottom right hand side is gonna be at height zero. As we have seen, remember the C was giving me zero if you are actually answering correctly, so I put those axes inside, the axes are giving me the y tilde, I compute the distance between the y tilde and the y, I have a small cost, therefore I have a small energy. That is the, that's the energy I show you, this the incompatibility level between the inputs. In this case, the inputs are gonna be the uh, red, you can see the, the, the red inputs are having a low energy, right? The, you understand, right, what's going on, okay. How many of these planes do I have? This is a plane for the class Y equal the first class, right? And then I'm gonna have four more, right, exactly. And so if I switch between the different planes, you have basically a 2D function for, three, uh, for five different possible cases. And since you might like, uh, usually my students like rotating stuff, uh, I have this animation for you. Uh, where you can see basically how this uh, energy grows very quickly as soon as you move your uh, locations of compatible axes. Okay, this is again my energy. Why do we care about energy? <sighs> That's a good question. But because you can actually use gradient descent to go down the energy and find the uh, input where which is most compatible with your specific target. We can do many more interesting things if we start talking about, for example, about the Zs, the things that we never see in future lessons. Okay, so we can do many things right now depending on what you want. I have a very nice set of slides about backpropagation which is explaining to you those very weird uh, formulas we have seen on the left hand side. Or I can also show you some uh, coding uh, either before or after uh, how to make these things done, uh, work in, uh, in PyTorch. Which, okay, hands up, see? Hands up for a little bit of notebook coding and see how we can put together the animation I just showed you before versus, okay, let me tell you the other option, versus getting a concrete understanding of how backpropagation works with very nice colorful mathematics and diagram. So, hands up for the coding PyTorch for classification. Okay, and now hands up for backpropagation diagram. Oh, 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 okay, fine, that's okay. That, that's actually unexpected. So I show you uh, eventually where to find the, uh, all the resources. Uh, everything is on GitHub accessible, but this actually took me quite some uh, effort. I haven't taught backpropagation, uh, like I started teaching backpropagation like one year ago, and when I started I'm like, wow, this stuff is actually tricky, right? So uh, yeah, I'm not a mathematician, so let's try to figure out how this works. So let's get back to my uh, diagram, okay? This is my neural network, the energy, something different, what's different there? Oh, okay, there is a O for output, and then there is a D for distance, right, I guess. Okay, so something changed because we are, okay, remember what is the loss? We are, what is the cost that we are using? 
negative log of inner product between y and y tilde. And y tilde is actually defined as the No, white tilde, yeah, but the formula for the white tilde? Soft dark max, which was defined as the ratio of the exponential. Now, guess what? You're taking a log of an exponential. Do you do that in uh, math? Yes. Do you do that with the computers? Why? Numerical problems. Did they do know when they wrote the packages at the beginning? <laughs> Not always, but anyway. So there is actually a book called The Recipes of Numerical uh, something on, on, on Amazon. It's very like a bestseller, I think. Anyway, so here we are actually switching a little bit of things. We are going to be um, simplifying the log with the exponential such, things, uh, such that things don't blow up. More details in a second. So let's revise what we have uh, learned so far. We have this hidden representation, which is this nonlinear function of my affine transformation of my input. And then I'm going to be having first here, I expand my, my first uh, line there. So we have this affine transformation, my A. Uh, it's just a shortcut for affine transformation. So I have the affine transformation of the hidden representation, which I call S for linear sum. Why is an affine transformation a linear sum? If you don't know, okay, think. If you know, good. Uh, you can ask me eventually. Doesn't matter. Uh, then we define O as being the G of S. What is this G? G is going to be a ah, new function. Log soft arc max. Okay, more, more words. It's going to be coming. Okay. All right, so guess what? A question for you. How much is going to be F? You should know the answer. D, very good. And guess what if I use the energy loss? What is the L? Eventually, yes, but before, one step before. F, F right? So we choose the loss, L, to be the energy. So that's my choice. So the first equality is actually a mistake. There should have been the, uh, the arrow. that I choose the loss to be the energy. And then the energy is defined as the sum of the boxes, just D. And D is going to be just the negative inner product between the target and O. There is some magic going on. But if you didn't catch it, very good. Just If you caught it, also good. If you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry. OK. Uh, let's remind ourselves what C, is, what C was. C was my negative uh, log of the inner product of the target and the prediction. And therefore, we have that we can figure out that O is simply the logarithm of my prediction, okay? the, the prediction, the y tilde. OK, so we are starting with this bad boy here. The partial derivative of the loss, which is the badness of my weights per my, for my input sample, with respect to my first matrix, Wy. Okay? So the first thing is going to be some sort of uh, also a matrix, right? Well, they, they transpose, but we can compute that by having that sequence of multiplication on the right hand side, which look a little bit uh, scary. Also, um, yeah, you also notice that I use the partial uh, of G with respect to DS, and that basically is the same as writing the partial of O with respect to S. But this notation it shows that this is a partial derivative of G. Again, if you don't know what's going on, don't worry. All right, so we had the W, the weights are going to be the collection of all my, weight, of my parameters, all the Ws, all the Bs, and so on. So what's next? I don't know what happened. What? Oh, I... Say again, sorry? That, yes, in the book, it's actually y tilde. I have to regenerate the slides, but that totally is correct. So that should be w of y tilde. Yes. Uh, OK, things disappeared. Why is that? Oh, OK. So let's start by flipping that box into this initial item. So this is my partial of d with respect to the o, such that I can start going backwards. So I compute the, uh, the gradient with respect to my output. And I will put it over there, right? So I can interchange D and L, doesn't matter. So I start putting next to O 
the partial with respect to O. So if O is a vector, a column vector, the left hand side is going to be a A partial derivative with respect to a column vector is a, what, what's the shape of the left hand side thing? In mathematics usually, in the numerator layout. Okay, we don't know. So the, the left hand side, it depends, you sometimes it's, it should be actually a, a row vector. And it's a row vector if we use this kind of uh, chain rule. If you use a column vector, you have to switch order of the multiplications, right? Again. No, not a major deal. So let's make some space over there. And we have that G is that uh, big log soft arc max. And then the combination of that S and O together is going to be my decoder here, which I just express as like a set of a affine transformation, which outputs my S, my linear sum, that goes inside this log soft arc max and then eventually spits out the O. So we're going to be putting that. Uh, over here. And now we can be going backward with this computation of gradients, such that we can compute what we're actually looking for, which is the how to change, what is the gradient with respect to my WY, the, the parameters contained in that matrix. All right, so let's clean up and show you some magic with PowerPoint. Um, okay, so here we have that. My last part, we had a linear sum that S goes inside this G, and then we have this O. My S, in this specific case, I will call it uh, input. And then the O is going to be my output. Next to the output, I'm going to have something I call the grad output. So out, next to the output, always we're going to have a grad output. And that we're going to be multiplying with this uh, partial derivative with, with the respect like, of the output with respect to the input. You can see how basically the the two, the, the partial with the O kind of simplify. And then you can basically recover this partial of L with respect to the S. The big question would be, how do we compute the thing in the, here in the center, right? We ignore this for the moment, we put it under the carpet. But that's how we basically we compute now the partial derivative with respect to the input. So when I talk about back propagation, if I'd like to be more precise, it's going to be the back propagation of, what are we back propagating? Can you read the name from the slide? In English, there is a English word. There is a name on, this, on the slide in English. It's very fainted, I don't know if you can see. The grad output, right? And so back propagation, if we would like to be putting a noun, the back propagation is the verb, I guess. We are, no, actually, no, it's back propagation is a noun, but okay, we are back propagating, there you go, it's English, okay. We are back propagating the grad, grad output, and then as you back propagate it, it becomes a grad input. Again, it's going to be the input for the next module, which is again it's going to be it's going to be a call again a output grad output, and again we're going to be doing this multiple times. All right, so we have this grad input, and we can basically write it down as the com combination of those two things, right? So we just multiply those two first symbols. Okay. All right, and then we can think about, uh, that was actually how Torch used to work. We had those two modules, we had two pathways. Each module had two ways, it had the forward pass, and then we had the backward pass. PyTorch works somehow in a different way because we actually have like a uh, computational graph that is generated on the, on the way, but again, you still go one way and then the other way to come back. And the first, the one way, the top one, the forward way, is going to be computing all these functions. And then instead, the backward way is going to be a multiplication, if you can see, right? It's a multiplication of the output gradient with all these partial derivatives, uh, well, the derivatives of each of the modules. That's basically what happens. All right, so let's move forward by drawing something there. Yeah, so I drew that on the left-hand side. We multiply that uh, grad output with respect to this derivative of the G function, and then I'm going to be getting this grad input. Okay. Guess what's next? Now we have the grad input of this system, which is going to be the grad output for the next item. So this is going to be my hidden representation H, which goes inside the affine transformation. The affine transformation <coughs> gets fed in also those weights, W wise and it gives me that S, my linear sum. So input in this module is going to be the H, the output is going to be this S. 
Similarly, I have a grad output, which is exactly the grad input of the uh, well, previous module. And how do I compute now the grad input? Well, now, we do we care about grad input? No, now we'd like to compute something else. Now we're gonna be computing the partial derivatives of my output with respect to the weights. And that's a bad guy, right? We don't know, uh, we don't want to know maybe something. Uh, we, don't know, we don't want to know what is the, the, the shape of that thing. Let's forget about the, these ugly things. But again, if I multiply my grad output by the partial with respect to the weights, I'm going to be getting those S's basically simplify if you want. You're gonna get this partial of the, less, of the loss with respect to the weights. And these are called, going to be called my grad weight. So finally, I have what I was looking for. What is this grad weight? This grad weight were the thing I was looking for, right, at the beginning. This is going to be the direction in which I should, something's beeping there. Why, why, do we care about, why do we care about these grad weights? Because we can go backwards to minimize the, the loss, right? But here actually we are, which loss we are minimizing if I, if I take a step backward in this case? The capital L loss, right? Which is per sample, which would be stochastic gradient descent. Okay, maybe too much information. All right, we can put a big bullet there and we have this module all combined. So something is missing here. Something, there is something wrong, right? What's wrong? Uh, let me first draw those two things there. And then I'm gonna be asking you, what, what happened with the bias? Where, where, where should be the bias there? I forgot the bias, right? So how can I uh, update this diagram to make it correct, correct, yeah, to fix it? Do, do you understand what's missing? When you compute the affine transformation of the H, I also need the offset term, right? So in theory, I should have another circle feeding uh, that A with the bias term. But also we can actually think about of augmenting the H with an additional one on top, and we can simply have a additional, um, additional uh, row on that matrix, right? Anyway, um, additional column on that matrix, right? The first column. Okay, so how about the grad bias? Why there is no grad bias there? Or actually, is there? Is there a grad bias on that slide or not? Isn't it? How much is the grad bias? That is correct, yes, because how do you know that? Because if you do the, uh, the gradient with the S with respect to the B, it's gonna be just one, right? You have, this basically you have the grad output is gonna be the same as the grad, uh, grad bias. And so sometimes, actually, I say that if you would like to check your, your, your gradients, instead of writing hooks, you can just maybe have a quick look at the grad bias, unless if you don't use batches and so on, and you can actually have now a quick way to check what, what are your gradients. Why would I want to check my gradients? It could be zero, right? So I'd like sometimes to have a look to my gradients to make sure things are just uh, working fine. So some trickery, right, you can learn here. All right, so what's next? Next is gonna be the, okay, I just put on things. Oh yeah, so I, I switch between, I have no idea what's happening here, okay. I'm trying to compute the other uh, gradient. How about the gradient with respect to the WH? Well, I can simply do the same thing and I keep going. Uh, I compute now, what am I computing if I multiply the grad output by that uh, derivative? I get the grad input of this affine transformation. Why do I need this grad input? To move, to move down this, uh, this tree, very good, right? So this one allows me to actually move down here, and then you just keep repeating this uh, set of operations, you can actually get all your, all your gradients. Okay, okay, so this is, I, I don't know if you saw this before, I think it was just uh, nice to show you. Now I have a few slides, or, well, I have some code as well. How much time I have left? Oh, okay, very good. So, Maybe, let me show you this one, okay? So I should tell you why the soft argmax and, right? Oh no, 
Yes, let me tell you about softmax and so on. Very briefly, right? And then I show you the code. So I, I'm very uh, picky and annoying about this uh, softmax and softmin because, well, there are other functions that are called that way. So let, let's fix, fix broken nomenclature. I will have here a vector of n components, e1, e2, yada, yada, until en. And I'm going to be defining this thing here. Soft means it's uh, square bracket means it's optional, like in Unix, or you know. And then the star star means either max or min. So there I have four different functions. I have soft max, soft min, man and max and min. Let's just go with max and min. If I have a vector of n components, I ask you what is the maximum? How many numbers are you going to be telling me? One number. Okay. I have a vector of n numbers, and I ask you what is the minimum? Okay, very good. That's very good. Now I'm going to be having a vector of, of n numbers, and I ask you what is this softer maximum? You still give me one number, right? I mean, if this makes sense, right? We are just looking for one number that is either the max, the mean, or the softer maximum or softer minimum. What is this beta? We don't care, it's optional. You see the square bracket, but that's the coldness. And again, it comes from Boltzmann and so on, right? But let's forget about that. All right, so the softmax definition for, for me is going to be this 1 over beta, the log of the sum of the exps. The exponentiated version, like the exponential, exponentiated components of the vector, all scaled by beta first. And so this number here is going to be a scalar, right? I just sum scalar numbers, and it's going to be, again, a scalar. What happens now if I take that beta and I crank it up? So beta is called coldness, so if I freeze this softmax, where does it freeze? Can you tell me? What happens if beta becomes very, very, very large? And I take a sum of exponentials with a very, very large, one is going to be very, very large. The largest value is going to be eating all the other values, right? And so if I take the log of this very large exponentiated value, I'm going to get this large value. And then I remove the beta. So I kind of undo whatever I had done before. And so again, if I freeze this one, it freezes to the max, right? So it's like an ice cream. If you put it outside in Serbia today, Novi Sad, it's going to melt. Where does it melt? OK, next slide, don't worry. I take it in and I put it in the freezer. It freezes. Where does it freeze? No one talks. To the maximum, right? Very good. OK. So guess what? We can also define something called soft min. It's going to be exactly the same thing, but I have flipped the sign of beta. So this is going to be my soft min. Again, a number that is uh, describing like a vector of blah, whatever numbers. Where does it freeze? I think you can guess that. Mean, right? Okay, very good. Oh, yeah, so you can actually define that from the softmax, and again, uh, it freezes to the mean. Let me show you another one uh, here. So uh, this is the only difference. I have the angular brackets instead of the parentheses, and then instead of having the sum, I'm going to have the average, okay? You can see that. So I take the average of the components rather than the sum of the components. So it turns out that, again, we are in Novistad. I take the ice cream, I put it outside. This stuff melts to the word that I call average, right? I cannot call it what is called there because first of all, I don't like saying that word, it's sad. But like it's mean, right? But, but then it's also the same word as the same sound from my mouth that is mean, M-I-N. And so in order not to confuse my students, I will never say M-I-N and M-E-A-N as mean because I don't know which sound I should make. So I call the, sec the, the thing there in the center average. Anyway, so you, you, you warm up the system and this stuff melts to the average. You freeze it, one, melts, one freezes to the minimum, the other freezes to the maximum. And so you're going to see this nice plot. So first of all, before uh, explaining how this works, what type of chart is this? Don't answer incorrectly. Just looking at the axis. So let's start easy. Lo let's look at the horizontal axis. What type of axis is that? Oh, that's a logarithmic axis. Very good. I go from very hot temperature on the right-hand side to very frozen temperatures on the, sorry, uh, I go from fro hot on the left to frozen on the right, right? That's the beta. How about the vertical axis? 
Don't, don't, don't say wrong things. Do we know? Yeah, symmetric logarithm. Right? We have someone that knows how to use matplotlib. Yes, good. All right, so this is what is sym symmetric logarithm. It allows me to show you very large numbers and very negatively large numbers in a logarithmic scale. So there is a, a linear part between one and negative one, which is gonna be a linear uh, graph. And then I have this logarithmic scale outside the, like from one to wherever up and from negative one wherever down, okay? All right, so we can see here there are multiple functions. From the bottom one, we have the soft mean, the one with the parentheses. As you move to the right hand side, you freeze to the minimum, okay, which is that vector on the bottom right hand side, you have five components. Uh, the lowest one is gonna be negative 2.18, and so that's where the soft mean freezes. If you're extremely cold, freeze, freezes there. If you warm up, the soft mean actually is gonna be always lower the, uh, the minimum, right? It's, this is actually sometimes very uh, useful. The one with the angular brackets instead, it warms up to the, it melts to the average, you can see now, right? The average is gonna be that negative point uh, 29. Now instead, they have the dash soft uh, max, the one the, with the angular brackets, which goes from the average in, when it's very hot, it freezes to the maximum, and then you can take the last one, which is going to be the soft max with the parentheses, if it, it's frozen at the maximum, and then it's gonna be always above, and it goes up, okay? This is soft max and soft mean. Why are we using this? What we are using this for? Many things. And not today, but you can have some videos on YouTube. And now finally, in the soft arg max and soft arg main. Yeah, too many people drop the arg. So what's going on here? I have a vector uh, E of n components. Now I have the soft arg max, soft arg min, arg max, and arg min. This stuff is gonna be going from a vector of n components to something that is basically a simplex, but we don't really care. Oh, we can also think about the box. Uh, the simplex lives inside this box uh, of n, n dimensions. The square bracket are mean, means it's optional, and that beta there is the coldness. The triangle with the n minus one is gonna be simply the simplex. Simply the simplex, okay, that's the cute thing there. Uh, the simplex, every point has the sum of all the components equal one. So it like, looks like a probability. All right, so soft argmax finally is going to be this uh, ratio of my exponentiated uh, vector, which is being scaled by beta and divided by the sum of all these components, the exponentiated components. Uh, that thing on the, on the numerator is a vector and the thing on the denominator is gonna be a scalar. Guess what happens if I freeze this one? Where does this stuff freeze to? The argmax, right? And the argmax to me is going to be the one hot representation of the argmax, right? It's gonna be this one with all the other zeros. So this is gonna be a very spiky, uh, if you want probability distribution, when you freeze it. How about the soft argmin? Well, you just take the negative beta, you just flip the sign of the beta, and basically you can have the same as having the soft argmax with the negative uh, component there, the negative sign inside. Where does the second one freezes to? Argmax, okay, very good. Question, where does this stuff melt to? What happens to, to this spiky probability, frozen in the, in the freezer? I take it outside in Novisad today. Uniform distribution over all the components, right? Very good. And so this is going to be eventually where this stuff melts to. And so, also something interesting here. This soft argmax is actually the derivative of the softmax with the parentheses or with the square or with the angular brackets. Ha! Huh. And now we finally have the big picture. How these softmax and soft argmax are connected and where they come from. Again, we haven't used it here. If I actually end up teaching you the advanced class on the Zs and so on, we're gonna be extensively using softmax and soft argmax and so on. So it may, might be interesting, okay? So if I have a soft mo soft max module in my network and I do backprop, I'm gonna get the soft argmax, right? Okay. And then we can also say that. Some people don't like it, but it's true. Okay. I don't know, if you, if you like it, you don't like it, I like it. Anyway, let me show you how this works. I have my same vector as before, my uh, vector with five components. 
On the right hand side, I have the frozen version in blue, which is super cold. And you can see the, <coughs> the, the frozen version, I have this uh, entire mass going uh, on the first class, on the first entry, and then basically zero for all the others. And instead, if I warm up the, the system, this stuff just <laughs> melts right to this uh, uniform distribution. Um, okay, and that's pretty much all I wanted to show. Now, I think we have how much left? Oh, okay. So now it depends on you. I still have the notebooks. Okay, everything is recorded, everything is on YouTube. In the next, I do have more slides and also I have more notebooks. So I have one notebook. I can show you where the notebooks are and you can just run them all and everything just runs and there are explanations there. The slides don't have explanation. That's why maybe it's nicer to have me speaking. The next slides are actually showing you how this energy can be used for showing you that the classification is a contrastive learning technique. This is a bit more, more interesting, maybe more, more complicated. Or oh, the other one would be the easy way out. We have PyTorch code and, okay, hands up for the contrastive learning. Oh, wow. Okay, this was completely unexpected. You actually like this sort of things. Very good. Okay, I keep moving. I, I thought I was off topic, but see? That's why we don't have the slides beforehand because I don't know what I'm gonna be talking about. Very good, very good. I, I improvise, I'm a, I'm a jazz, jazz player. Uh, cross entropy versus negative linear output. Two possible energy perspective for a classifier. Ha, huh. so what's going on? So now, why are we talking about this energy? Because I can actually give, let me drink some water. So I don't, I don't die. All right, better. All right, so we're gonna be actually starting to understand a little bit more about this energy. So far, everything was the same, right? Loss equal, okay. Loss chosen to be the energy. Energy equal the sum of the boxes. Single box, single term. So everything is equal to the other. Let me actually jump, jump start that because it's bothering me now. And I show you a circuit that is a little bit more more interesting, okay? Question for you, what is the energy of this system? Yeah, exactly, right? So you have that new letter, capital E, and capital E function of X, Y, and Z is going to be H, H plus C plus D plus R. So now we have actually more boxes, so we have more multiple components that are summing together. This is similar to a factor graph, right? But then that stuff is multiplicative, this is addi additive, right? Because we are in the log space, but again, we don't care. Okay, and that's what I wanted to tell you. There's more going on on this slide, but we don't care. So first of all, we can actually remove that last equality between L and D or L and C. In this case, because we have, my bad. We, we can remove the last equality between F we, we encounter so far and D or C, because in this case, that F is called E, yeah, different change of variable, but same stuff. But here actually, I show you that it is the actual sum of the boxes. First, the other one instead, that is gonna be the second uh, equality we are gonna be breaking right now, which was the equality with the arrow. Remember, we had an equality with the arrow, which is I am choosing to set my loss being equal the energy, and that was my choice. We are gonna be doing, removing that equality right now. I show you the remotion of the last equality, just before, I remove the second equality. So why, why is this actually relevant? Why does it, does it matter? So these things are degrees of freedom you're gaining, right? If you're always doing maximum likelihood, you're always doing the thing that you are supposed to do. Is there more out beside that? Yes, there are two degrees of freedom more than that, right? And so I'm showing you how to get more options, right? Not because, you know, deep learning and machine learning. Do you know, you try many things, right? It's empirical science. And then things usually don't work. And then how do you move forward? Where well, you try something else. And the 
major thing is going to be the more way to move forward, the more experiments you can try to figure out the right way to move forward. You don't necessarily know in advance where you're going to find the major obstacles, but then if you have multiple ways to move, maybe you just go beside them, besides them, right? So here I'm going to give you like more tools to actually understand what's going to be going on on the lower side, on the lower level, okay? Major point. Again, again, introductory topic, so I don't know. Cross entropy. So then let me tell you some bit. So we have this X at the bottom. It goes inside this predictor, which has the uh, is going to be also feeding my first affine transformation. The output of my affine transformation is going to be this linear sum S. I send the linear sum through the what's called the function that takes my S and gives me my Y tilde. Soft argmax, very good. So we send this S through the soft argmax. I'm going to get my Y tilde. Then we had to compare my Y tilde with my the blue ball Y through my box that was called. Very good. So you actually have understood how these diagrams work. And so I can also write the mathematics then. I have my C, the cost, telling me how bad I am at shooting. It's going to be the negative log of the inner product between the target and the Y tilde. Very good. Then I have the big box, it's going to be my F, my overall energy. So I can write on the top, F equals C. Okay, no magic so far. Now the magic begins. I have my loss functional. Ooh, what is a functional? Don't worry, it's something that people in computer science call a function of a function. Again, this functional is going to be giving you a scalar out of a function. It's going to be just evaluating your function. So since they don't like to have a function evaluating a function, they call it a functional, that's it. On the left-hand side, what is my loss functional? We decided, the thing we already seen before, to choose one step before that. Eventually, it is correct, your answer, but there is one step you're, we are skipping in the, in the reasoning. Remember the arrow, the equality with the arrow on top? I didn't hear, sorry. Energy. The energy, right? So we chose before, that's a, like a cho choice I make. I choose for my left, <laughs> left hand side to have my loss to be equal the energy. Okay. And that's so far, it's like a recap of what we have seen so far. On the right hand side, instead we're gonna be talking about the negative linear output. Huh, okay, what's going on? So I have again my X, it goes inside this predictor and the first affine transformation, it spits out my S and this S, it somehow compared to my target through a D box. What's going on here? This is so weird. Okay, we don't know what's going on, but so far let's keep at it. And here we have the D is gonna be the one we see, we seen before. The D was the in negative inner product between the, those two things. Okay, so here, if I have my energy, my energy is gonna be what? Definition of energy. I don't hear. Who talk? Yeah, so in this case, D, okay. So that's correct, so I write it on the top. So I have my energy, it's going to be my linear output. Well, negative linear output, right, because I changed the sign. So the D basically extracts one of the components of my final linear layer, right? I have a five dimensional final linear output and the D allows me to select one of these items and I, I change the sign. Okay, weird. And now if I choose this specific uh, set of things, what's gonna be with this loss? What's missing now? Like from the left hand side to the right hand side, what is missing right now? One thing got disappeared, right? Yeah, the white tilde disappeared, but where, how, where, where we, how, we, how were we computing white tilde, right? Yeah, there is a logarithm that is, is gone, but there's another one. The, the, another thing is going to be gone. The soft argmax, right? So right now, I'm moving the soft argmax away from my neural network circuit into the loss. So now I augment the loss as being the soft argmax of this final output. Huh, why? 
because it's going to teach you something. Okay? So before I play the last animation on this slide, let's figure out together what I should put in the center. Okay? How is this soft argmax? Where is the soft argmax there? Right? Okay, so now is this pretty stuff starts uh, and begins. Again, stop me if you're getting lost, right? Ask questions. Now it's maybe a little bit more tricky. So we have the D is going to be this selector, right? You have an inner product of the one hot with a vector. So that's basically selecting one of the components. And so on the, also we have, the, we have the notion that this F is going to be this D, okay? F is the scalar, the energy, which is going to be this negative selection. Now, a funny symbol. In this specific, specific case, if I have D of this big ca curly capital Y, I basically select all of them. Okay? This is going to be all possible energy. So how many possible values can Y take? I don't know. I have five classes. So I have five possible different energies. Okay? So that's going to be my energy function, the full function. Whereas the one on top is basically an evaluation of the energy function with a specific, a specific target. Do we understand the difference? In mathematics, there is always a very thin uh, distinction between a function and the evaluation of a function over a specific thing, right? Sometimes you write the function with a dot instead of the variable to specify that's the actual function rather than the evaluation of the function over the specific variable, right? In a random variable, you have the capital X and lowercase x, right? Okay, you know. Okay, so let me write down the loss. What is the loss? How can I write the loss now? Given that I have the S. The loss was the negative log of the inner product of Y tilde and Y. And Y tilde was coming out from the soft dark max of the S. So if I have soft arc max of the, well, I have a negative S. How do I do a soft arc max if I have a negative S? From three slides ago. Very good, very good, very good. So let me write down that. So I have my loss is going to be the negative log of the inner product of my target and the soft arc mean of the energy of the system. Hmm. And this capital like F of the X and Y is going to be giving me the full vector, right? So soft argument of that thing is going to be giving me exactly Y tilde, right? You, you, you figured that out, that, that out, right? Okay. So soft argument negative S, same as soft arc max plus X, soft arc max of plus x, y tilde. y tilde inner product with y is exactly the thing we were getting before. So, so far, no magic. So what was the definition of soft argument? Soft argument is going to be, again, the exponentiated version of, the, uh, of, the, of the, that vector divided by the sum of all the uh, exponentiated components. OK, so now what happens if I take the log of this expression here? I take the log of a, uh, of a ratio, I get a difference, very good. The first log and the exponential simplify, the negative one over beta and the negative beta simplify. So I'm gonna be getting simply what? Can you tell me? Minus beta, one over beta and beta simplify, right? On the inside. Do you see? I take negative one over beta log of this thing over here. So log simplify with the exp, negative one over beta simplify the negative beta. I'm gonna be getting that the loss is gonna be F, F and then what? Minus minus, last term, okay? So I have F minus minus, so plus, one over beta, log sum exp, oh! What is that thing? Last one, what is the last thing? The, the last term, we, we learned about that 10 minutes ago. It's soft something, yes. Who can guess what soft is? Almost a soft mean? 
we are getting there. Minus. Minus soft main. Very good, very good. So that is my negative soft main. Okay, okay. And how do we train the system? By computing Talk back to me. We have three minutes left. We have to gradients. Okay. What happens if I compute the gradient of the soft main? Soft arg main. Ha. Huh. That's why all things are coming together. Let's see how this goes. Okay. Very good. So first of all, let me actually press play in this previous slide. So we figure out that the loss for the right hand side is going to be this F plus, well, F minus the soft main. Okay. So I'm going to be writing this one here on the top. We have loss is going to be F minus soft min. Okay. So interestingly, interestingly, what happens if I freeze the system? If I freeze the system, I'm going to be having the energy, the, the loss is going to be the energy of the correct uh, entry minus the energy of the most offending entry. And this is the perception learning rule from 1957, Rosenblatt. Uh, yeah, Rosenblatt, right? Yeah. So that's actually where the perception learning rule comes into play. Let's, uh, let's actually compute this gradient. So I, I kind of speed up because we are running out of time. If I compute the gradient uh, with respect to the energy of this loss, I'm going to be getting what? With respect to the first component, I'm going to get a 1. And the second component, I'm going to be getting this negative uh, soft mean, I can, I, I can actually replace it with this P, okay? And this P is simply the soft mean, which is the also, okay, I'll tell you in a second what it is also. And then on the other side, if I compute the gradient for these other terms, these red guys, these red guys are the all possible classes but the correct one, so all the incorrect classes. So if I compute the gradient with respect to the incorrect class, I'm going to be getting exactly the same, but a zero in the first item, right? Because the first item is the correct entry. So I'm going to get zero minus the probability of the wrong stuff. And so if I just compute, uh, sorry, what, what's happened? There, something happened? Oh, okay. I didn't show you that one. So the last one, we saw that, that the probability is simply the white tilde, right? On the, on the right-hand side. And this one here is going to be also the white tilde. If you put those two things together, it's going to be very interesting. The gradient with respect to the energy is simply the difference between the target and the, and the prediction. Where do we have that gradient? Where, where have you seen that gradient before? When is your final output gradient? Just the difference between the target and your prediction. But there is another type of task where you have the gra final gradient to be just a difference. Regression, right? And so now, oh, classification and regression have the same gradient? What? Do you know that? Okay, let me go. Last, last slide. Then I, I be, I'm going to be gone. So that's very interesting. Uh, bread for thought, right? I was just speaking in Italian. But yeah, do you know this expression, bread for thought? Okay, just think about this stuff. Anyway, let me give you the three cases. So first case, all the energy are uh, zero. All energy are zero. I have that, I compute the soft, uh, soft mean of all the zeros. I get the uh, uniform distribution. So all of these things will be uh, pushed up a little bit. And then I'm going to get the good gradient like the, for the correct case pointing down for the correct class. So you have that, this loss. I mean, this gradient is going to be pushing down. You can see here, right? This gradient is pushing down on the correct case, the blue guy. And then it push up. So this is one hot, right? The, the blue guy. This is one hot. That is this one, one thing pushing down here. And this white tilde is going to be, if I have all the entries zero, if you do the soft arg mean of all zero, you're going to be getting, we said, all uh, uniform. And so every possible class gets uh, increase, but then the, the correct class get pushed down entirely. Wow. And so after one step of gradient descent, 
you're going to get the energy for the correct class gets lower a little bit. In case it's frozen, you're going to be getting back the perception learning rule. What, why does that, what does it mean? In this case, you're going to get the correct entry, the blue one, will get my negative gradient of uh, 1 in magnitude. Then I'm going to be getting the um, gradient of the most offending case, which is this one, the actual mean, because if you freeze the soft mean, you're going to get the exact minimum. And so this guy gets the most, gets one gradient up, right? That, that's the perception. Perception, you just push up the, your wrong prediction, and you, pu you, you, you pull up the correct prediction, you pull up the incorrect prediction, you push down the correct one. And then after you, you do that, you manage to actually flip the blue guy with the red. And in the most generic case, where you're going to be having an arbitrary energy, you're going to be pulling up proportional to the probability that the model assigned to each of the classes. The more probable the, uh, the model is, like the more probable a class is for the model, the more will be pulled up. And then you push down on, uh, on the correct case for one, for the correct one, right? And then you're going to be getting these new values. And so in this case here, when I show you this example here, we, s we have seen how a classification can actually well, it is a contrastive technique. What is a contrastive technique? It's a technique that is training your system to assign low energy on the correct cases, in this case, the blue guy, and then it tries to rise the energy of all the other uh, incorrect cases. And so if you choose, you know, uh, the, the, the how to look at these circuits in a proper way, in this case, using this negative linear output, you can actually observe this very interesting, uh, I guess, uh, quirks of how these systems work. The talk is over, but let me show you where the repository is, such that you can find the, the, the notebooks uh, that we didn't cover. So if you go on GitHub, uh, you should be able to find this, uh, my face, like, you, you find this ad call, okay? So ad call is gonna be my, is my username when I use Unix machines. You, if you want to take a picture, you can take a picture, such that you have this for a reference. I count till three, two, one, done, okay. All right, so then you have the first repository is gonna be this deep learning uh, spring 20, there is a deep learning spring 21, and there is a deep learning spring 22. Uh, you want to care about this deep learning, so if you go in the repository, you type NYU, you have all the three. In the deep learning, uh, there is also AI, okay. In the 22, you have this notebook here, where I basically go over back propagation the same way we did in class, but then with PyTorch. So you can actually compare the same results we got in the slides with the actual things that PyTorch does. So I would recommend checking out this backprop notebook. And then if you go back to the spring um, 21, there is this uh, notebook over here, the spiral classification. And this one is basically giving you the code to, to basically generate those animations you saw at the beginning of the class. Finally, there is one more repository just because we are here. And there is the Spring 20, where also, whereas you can also find the um, regression notebook, okay? So there are three notebooks for entry level. There's a regression from Spring 2020. From 21, you have the spiral classification with this energy and the 3D rendering. And then from the last 2022, you have this back propagation which shows you uh, how the computational graph in PyTorch is generated and how it actually matches the numbers we, uh, we, we did before with the, with, the, with, the, with the slides. The lesson is over. If you, there's a question. What happened, sorry? Yes. Oh, wow. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Because it's fall, so this is spring learning fall 22. That's, that's finally fixed. Yeah. OK, thank you. There is this one. This works. Uh, you just come over here. Well. Thank you, Alfredo, for a very, very nice talk. I really enjoyed it, and as I, as I 
wrote on Twitter while I was live following your talk. Uh, it shows time and time again how no matter how much years you spend in deep learning, you can still benefit from learning fundamentals because I did not know everything that you showed at oh, the wow. very beginning. So, nice. great stuff. So, because of the delay, unfortunately, we don't have time for a lot of questions. I will read out the most upvoted question on the Slido, and then we're going to have a 10-15 uh, minute break. So the top, and you can obviously bother Alfredo all week to ask him questions, right? <laughs> yeah. So the top question on Slido is, what is the point of introducing the term energy at all if it's just another name for a cost function? <laughs> okay, so <laughs> the energy is used for inference. And we haven't seen the lessons where we actually use the energy for doing anything meaningful. So the we have different terms, right? We have three different terms that are actually represented as scalars. We have these boxes, the red ones. The, the small boxes are, again, are measuring these distances between uh, variables that we have inside our neural circuits. And these are, again, a way to make sure that things get hinged somewhere, such that we have these springs, basically, I will call them springs, that are on, in attention at the beginning. And then as we are basically training the system, the system will try to relax these springs. And by re we relax the springs by computing the gradient of the energy. If you, are, if you study physics 101, what happens if you compute the gradient of an energy? You get a force, right? And so by following these forces, we are going to be able to actually go down and then find like a minimization of this energy. So again, we have these small boxes which are representing these springs that we are putting in order to get uh, the system to move in specific directions. Then the collection of all the springs are giving us the energy, and then the energy is, can be used in during inference to actually find specific inputs that are going to be in nice locations. So let's say I train, I don't know if we want to turn off this green blue thing, but okay. Uh, for example, I could use this energy to um, do some sort of denoising. I have a corrupted input, and then this input will likely have a high energy. And then I can do a little bit of gradient descent to find a new location which has now a lower energy. And so this can be, uh, again, allows you to basically correct the, the height, like the, the, again, the corruption that the input has. The energy is used at the inference. Then, the loss is going to be what we use to shape the energy. So the loss is going to be what we're going to be using eventually, and with gradient descent during training only, to change what is going to be eventually the shape of the energy. But the shape, the energy itself, is what our, we are interested in after we train the system. And when we talk about contrastive learning, contrastive learning are specific types of loss that allows me to actually assign low energy to good sample and then high energy to bad sample. Like we saw in the case today with classification, when we are using that specific loss, it was pushing down on the good sample, on the blue one, and then pulling up on the, uh, on the bad one. And such that, eventually, when you finish to train the system, you're going to be getting a well-behaved energy, which allows you to, again, possibly navigate your input space with this kind of uh, value. But again, one thing is the loss, which is what is used to find a nice behaved energy, and the loss doesn't have to be the energy itself. As we have seen today, the specific loss we were using was actually a subtraction of two terms, which was one energy and then the soft mean of the energy. So again, <laughs> they are not the same thing, and each of these allow us for an additional degree of freedom uh, for training our systems. Okay? I guess that's the answer I could give. And in the advanced lesson, if it's going to happen eventually this week, we're going to be seeing how to actually move throughout the energy with these latent variables, which are going to be using the soft mean and so on to find uh, ways of uh, addressing the fact that sometimes some inputs might have multiple correct uh, uh, output. For example, I'm driving a car, and then I may take a left way or a right. I take half of the times left, half of the time right. I try to do regression, and the model will tell me to go straight, right? Instead, if I have latent variable model, given that I know in which of the direction I'm going to be turning, it's going to be just learning how to turn left, how to turn right, and it's going to be disambiguate the two options without just computing the average overall. 
Again, so that would be the idea for the ad advanced lesson for, uh, for the future. That's it. I end. Hopefully, source people's interest for the advanced lesson. Yeah, 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 yeah.